Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Today, our show is going to deal with opportunities to sell energy to the utility, comparative bidding for system resources, and reflecting a, a, a change uh, in the paradigm uh, where instead of um, you know generating all the electricity all by itself, um, in fact, wine electric is uh, is, is is put out RFPs to get electricity from others, and and our guest today is Greg Shimakawa, uh, and in a moment we're going to hear exactly what he has to say about that. <music> Welcome to the show, Greg. Nice to have you here, and nice to be able to talk to you about this because it it really is, in the larger sense, very important. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay Moyne. Thanks for thanks for having me. I'm happy to talk about our, you know, our renewable energy efforts at Hawaii Electric. So you uh, issued a press release a week ago. Uh, can you talk about you know generally uh, what what is in there of note and why did you issue that press release? Sure. So I think bigger picture, you know, we have our 100% renewable energy target by 2045. You know, we have interim targets. The next one is 40% by 2030. Um, you know, Hawaiian Electric, we as a company have made a commitment to have a 70% reduction in carbon emissions from 2005 levels by 2030. Um, so lots of drivers um, you know, to move forward with this renewable energy push. And you know, for customers, it's to, it's to stabilize bills, it's to, to get off of fossil fuel, to be um, you know, more self-sufficient um, you know, here in Hawaii. So lots of good reasons for, for moving forward with this. So this effort and with the press release i think that that's been out recently this is really our third um third stage of large renewable energy procurements that we've been doing at hawaiian electric um you know, across all, all the islands in our territory so Hawaii island this in particular the larger islands hawaii island maui and oahu this is our third round of of doing these rfps so starting you know back in 2017 when we um first started really to move towards this um Third party own, you know, paradigm for for generation. I, I can read more about it on your website. What is it? Hawaiianelectric.com? Yep, Hawaiianelectric.com and Hawaiianelectric.com slash competitive bidding is you know all the information for for these RFPs, you know, for the ones that we've done in the past are you know archived on that page. That's a good place for folks who are interested in participating to get all the information that they need about. Requirements, deadlines, you know, RFP documents, those those are all there. Okay, and you are the director of renewable acquisitions of Hawaiian Electric. What what is what is that? Sure. So my team um, at Hawaiian Electric and across you know all islands, we really manage that relationship with third party, um, you know, independent power producers from really cradle to grave. So from the front end, where we are, you know, with these RFPs, scoping them, putting them together. Um, you know, taking feedback, getting them approved by the Public Utilities Commission, and then ultimately running them. We're, you know, we're, where we are today with, the, with this stage, we'll we'll put the RFPs out. We'll take the bids in. You know, evaluate them with our you know our large team of subject matter experts at the company, and then ultimately we'll make awards. And then you know, other parts of my team, you know, will will negotiate those contracts. You know, hopefully um, get those agreed to and then submitted. Back to the Public Utilities Commission for their approval, um, and then once that's once that's done, um, you know we'll we'll shepherd them through construction and you know into service, and then for the life of those contracts, you know usually 20, 25 years of of contracts. So we are involved from the beginning all the way to the end of, of those processes. Mm. So how long does it take between the time you know you go to the PUC in the first place, get permission to issue the RFPs? Till the time that the PUC will ultimately approve the proposals that come in and authorize the work, uh, is that a matter of months or years? It it really depends, and I think both the PUC and Hawaiian Electric. We want to make sure that um, what we're doing reflects, you know, the, the, the broader will of and, and the needs of our of our communities. And so, what we've done, you know, and we've we've gotten better at this every time we do it is. Really going out and, and meaning in a meaningful way, getting stakeholder input and stakeholder feedback to to how we do our our RFPs. Um, you know, one one good example in this this most recent round is we've included um, for the first time you know a requirement for 
for developers to include a community benefits package, you know, with some some real parameters in there um, for the you know the host communities for projects. And so, really spelling that out is a, is a new thing, and that's a, that's something that we you know we heard in our in our, our many um, meetings with the community and discussions with with different different folks is that that was they want to make sure that there's there's some um, some give give back to the, the communities that are hosting these facilities because it you know there is impact. Well, yeah, and that's a great idea in this sense too, because um, ultimately the community is going to want to have a package, a developer is going to want to satisfy the community, and it's going to cost the developer some money. So, the developer and Hawaii Electric ought to know what that's about beforehand, so the developer can build it into his proposal. See, that's that's my reaction. Do you agree? That's correct. And so, I mean, it, it, there, there's always a cost for that, and I think. By putting it out there and putting in a floor, you know, minimum required requirement amount, um, that at least starts level the playing field for for developers that they all know that there's some level that they need to do. You know, nothing ever stopped them from from doing that before. Um, and the good developers would, you know, be very proactive about doing that and and about, you know, finding out really what what the host community needs are. Um, but now we're you know we're making that, um, you know, a stated requirement that that's that there's some parameters to what that. That would look like. So suppose I'm a developer, Greg, and I and I watch this show and I say, "Gee, I want to do that. I want to I want to supply energy to the utility. I want to be part of this paradigm shift. I want to be part of the renewable energy initiative. Um, what do I do, and what do I have to be in order to do it?" Sure. So we have um quite an extensive RFP process. And so all of those requirements and documents, those are that those are on our website, um, like you mentioned, hawaiianelectric.com slash competitive bidding. So for which particular islands RFP, you know, a developer might be interested in, those those requirements, those documents, those timelines are all, all listed there. Um, we do have dedicated email addresses for questions, specific questions and answers about um, the RFPs in general. Or about you know certain you know more detailed aspects. Um, you know we we answer questions that way, and that that's part of just um, the competitive process and being fair um, with the information that we're you know we're talking to and we're sharing with with different interested parties. Um, so that's that's also um, on our website for each particular RFP, and we'll you know do our best to respond to questions as as quickly as we can. Can you give me an example of what a developer would be? You know, the the size of the company, the mission of the company, the experience of the company. I mean, for example, Greg, could I say, look, I want to be a developer. I've never developed anything. I don't know anything about it, but I want to I want to write the Hawaiian Electric and and tell them that I'll do whatever is necessary. But what would be necessary? Sure. So that that that's a good question. And, and I think our answer and our requirements are that. And we want we want to pick developers or um, development teams. So you know you could definitely hui with with a bunch of different organizations. We, we want developers that have experience in this space, experience developing you know renewable energy projects at at this kind of large scale. Um, so I mean that that's sometimes a difference too. We want and, and that's really just to give you know the greatest assurance that you know what gets proposed actually gets built. And so having someone or at least having partners that have done it before, you know. It, ideally, be someone who's done it before here in Hawaii um, you know, would know the, the lay of the land the best. But if it's been on the, on the mainland or otherwise, just putting together a team of of experienced um, people is important. And then that that's actually a requirement and something that we evaluate mm -hmm. in the RFP. So, yeah, but ultimately, you're looking at whether it's likely that I will be able to follow through on my proposal to you. If it doesn't look like I could do it, you know, it's I'm not a good choice, right? That's correct. So, in, in addition to experience, um, you know, with putting projects in, you know, we have to demonstrate um, financial capability. You know, with the organization, know your you know your backers. Those are things that we look for, um, you know, in our evaluation process. So, um, I get a really um, important question. I suppose is. Uh, um, you're you're seeking a certain amount of power in this um, this um, stage of RFPs. How much are you seeking, and 
how sure are you that you will get what you're, what you're seeking? How sure can you be that you will get uh, what you're seeking in the way of these proposals? Sure. I, I think it's really hard ever to, to be sure that we'll, we'll get what we're seeking. I mean, I think we've identified planning needs and, and there's certain things that we, you know, we need, you know, most urgently, I, I think um, some of our firm power replacement or our, our own aging units on different islands. Um, you know, we've got some needs there. Um, so speaking just for Oahu, you know, we're looking at in the 2029 timeframe, you know, in the order of five to 700 megawatts of capacity. So, you know, a really large amount of of firm renewable capacity. And that'll, that'll allow us, um, you know, we've, we've already retired the coal plant, but that'll start to allow us to to retire, you know, more fossil fuel units that, that we have, you know, part of our Hawaiian electric fleet. Um, so that's that's a need on, on Maui, 40 megawatts. That's that would be to to replace eventually our Kahului power plant. That's um, you know also getting up there in, in age. Um, so that's those are some some of the the um, the urgent you know specific generation needs. And then we've got really large energy targets, and those would be met you know primarily by you know what you think of as renewable energy. So PV or PV with with storage wind projects um but really we're we're open to any any mature you know um proven technologies you know we're, we're not limited to you know we most likely see wind and solar but um, we're open to any proven renewable technology it has to be renewable though right correct so renewable under um under hrs under the rps uh, renewable law so <clears throat> uh so when you you talk about um um renewable acquisitions, but uh, inherent in your comment just a minute ago is that as these um, proposals come online, um, you're going to um, you're going to terminate other other generating facilities. Um, I know that may not be within the the scope of the director of renewable acquisitions, but can you talk about you know the plan to retire? Um, other non-renewable generating facilities uh, as these new ones come online? Sure. I mean, and I can only speak at a, at a relatively high level about, you know, retirement plans and, you know, decommissioning plans. But, you know, in general, as we start to get more viable, you know, renewable energy sources on our, our, on our different systems, that'll allow us to start to use our existing fossil fuel units less and less, um, you know. We imagine that it's not only a good for RPS and good for renewable energy decisions, but those should also, in most cases, be um, you know cost savings, you know, realized by by running you know more renewable and less fossil fuel. So that that's part of the reason why we're doing these competitive RFPs. We're trying to get you know, low prices for customers that you know that will really um, both stabilize and hopefully you know reduce bills if if that you know if we're able to do that as well. Yeah, competitive price is a big part of your press release. Uh, and <clears throat> I guess you want to achieve a competitive environment. So when these proposals come in, you want them, you're going to you're going to be most interested in the ones that are uh, at the lowest price. Right. Um, uh, is that if if I have two of them and they're mm, one of them is you know more advantageous, the lower price than the other, is that the sole standard or? Uh, could it be that you will take the higher price because you like the company with the higher price more? Sure, and that, that's a really good question. So the way the RFPs are set up is that, and the evaluations are set up, is that um, in our initial screening, we'll, we'll weight price as 60% of our of, of the weight, and the other 40% are through a number of non-price criteria. So for these RFPs, we have 11 different non-price criteria. So including, you know, you know, financial strength, their experience of the developer, um, community outreach, you know, those are those, that's a really important one. You're going to make sure that they've not only done their groundwork, but they have, you know, a, a fleshed out viable community outreach plan. And that's something that, you know, our community relations experts will, will evaluate and, and give feedback on, you know, once the project selected, we want to make sure that that that's done. Um, and that's that's been thought about. 
going to make sure that um, you know cultural resource impacts are are considered. That you know that due diligence is done in, in, on that part, and that there's a plan um, you know to address any issues that may come up during development. Um, we even are, are looking at um, carbon emissions. That that we there's a questionnaire that we have now, and this is a new kind category that there's some consideration given for um, you know life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then there, we even have now um, another new category that we, we brought in, um, and this is in, in response to, to stakeholder feedback, is that we will give some extra credit for um, land use uh, decisions. So if you're gonna cite a project on, you know, lower, lower grade agricultural land, or you know, not zoned agricultural land or brownfield type of type of situation, and there that 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 has a higher value, and you know we'll give a little bit of extra credit to that. Um, you know, recognize that there there's a balance, right, with with our the limited amount of of land available um, for for energy. Energy is only one one aspect of what we need to use our our lands for. That's the way it should be. I mean, there should be a formula out there where you are taking appropriate cognizance of everything that affects the state um, and the community and the environment and so forth. We have a lot of considerations. That's right. Um, I mean, we, we have, you know, a small part or a part to play in all of that, but we know we, we're definitely not, not alone in, in, in those, those decisions and those, those policy things that are happening. So if I, if I take all of it together under this stage of the RFP process, um, you know, there's a lot of energy here, 500 megawatts for Oahu, that's a lot. Um, uh, how, how, much, um, how much of the total state usage uh, am I going to have in renewables? It, it sounds like, um, you know, this will make significant progress toward 100%. Yep, that, that's correct. So, you know, the next milestone here is it's 40% by 2030. And that's that's with the, the, you know, the change in definition in the law um, for how the RPS is calculated. So it's a little bit of a higher bar than it was when the law was first passed. I mean, right now we're um, in the high 30s in terms of our RPS. So we're, we're well on our way to meeting that target. Um, if we were to get everything that we're seeking, so both those firm capacity numbers as well as the the energy numbers that we're um, we're looking for, um, you know, something like you know 965 gigawatt hours of, of annual energy on Oahu, so really large amounts of, of energy. If we're able to get everything that we're looking for, um, that RPS number is going to be up around sixty percent. So when you when you get a proposal, you evaluate it in terms of community response, but do you actually have community response on the? Agreement that you negotiate. There is. There are certain things that are um, included in the in the agreement. There's some um, obligations that are included there um, for a, a developer to do, um, and so we those are things that we we hold them to. Mostly on the front end of, of that process, once they're, uh, you know, we make sure that they have their their plan and they're working with the right people. Um, and when it goes in front of the PUC, when these each proposal would go in front of the PUC or each agreement based on a proposal, go, go to the PUC, does the public have a right to weigh in there when the PUC is considering that proposal, whether to um, you know, approve it or not? Yes. So you know, public comment, I think that the PUC will always take public comments um, on a particular proceeding, on a particular contract that's up for their approval. So that's that's definitely a, an avenue, and then you know also for the different government approvals that are required for a project, just like any other project, not you know not limited just to energy. There there are different opportunities for public participation depending what what kind of permits and and um, approvals are required. So when we say director of the renewable acquisitions, you're going to be involved in all of those steps all along the way. That is. Um, the RFPs, the proposals, the approvals, uh, and ultimately the construction. Right? That's a that's a big job. You're going to be busy for years on this. Huh? Sure. We, we've got parts of our company that are you know 
our energy de delivery areas and our, our engineers and our construction folks that are you know more closely involved but all of that will be under under the contracts the power purchase agreements that we're going to agree to with these these developers and the RFP and so ultimately yeah you know those contracts are are managed by by our team here so you know the the proposals you get are going to be somewhat technical in nature and they're and they're going to uh, you know by by requirement they're going to have to tell you how they expect to do it and what kind of technology they're going to use. And you mentioned that technology is a factor. Um, but technology changes. Uh, every time you look, uh, inverters are changing. The technology of solar cells is changing. It could be, you know, dramatic, dis dis disruptive, even disruptive changes. In fact, I, I think I read about uh, something in solar cells that's really a remarkable improvement um, in terms of efficiency, you know, and productivity and all that. Um, so query, uh, two, two parts to this. One is, are, are you asking for the most modern technology? Does modern technology, is that a factor in your approval um, of the proposal? Um, yeah, that's the first part of my question. Sure, so we've got you know, very um, detailed and specific um, performance requirements for, for these projects. And that, that's, that's mainly so that it, it can interact appropriately with our, our grid, right? Mm -hmm. It needs to, to, to play nicely with everything, with our system and our, our operations and everything else that's happening there. So we've got specific requirements and those requirements are different from, from the mainland. You know, oftentimes how, how our system works is really different from, from large, you know, more broadly interconnected mainland systems. So we've got different, um, you know, voltage and other kinds of requirements that, that projects need to meet. So every project is subject to a, a detailed, you know, interconnection requirement study and that's you know we'll, we'll model or we'll, we'll have modeled the, the different equipment that gets selected by a project so inverters for example so to make sure that what that how they're going to run and the capabilities that they have are you know appropriate and, and will will fit in with our our system and as a result of that there may be other requirements mitigations or things that that, that have to happen so those are all results of the further study that gets done once once we have projects selected. Well, suppose a developer comes to you with a proposal that has a brand new technology, um, a technology that is not in in place yet in Hawaii, uh, that hasn't been involved in you know previous developments, but you know it's promising, it's new, it's high tech, it's been developed with some very smart guys, and he says to you, Greg, I want to use this because I think I can get a you know, a, a better throughput or whatever it is, um, if I'm using this brand new technology. Where does this play? Because as you said a minute ago, you, you may have to have, you know, other accommodations to be sure that it plays well with your existing system. How do you handle a brand new technology? And is it good? Sure. So I think for brand new technologies, I think we want to see there our, our threshold for accepting those or selecting those in, in these RFPs at least is that it, it can't be brand new. It needs to be proven, you know, not necessarily in Hawaii, but proven at a at a relative similar scale. So utility scale. Um, so they need to show that the technology works at, at the that it's not in a you know R and D stage or not in a pilot kind of stage. That it it's actually working and it's commercial. Um, and that's really for the effort and the the investment that's going to be made in these projects that that they're, you know, the highest likelihood of success. So, you know, we're, we're definitely going to need new technology and, you know, cutting edge technology to get us all the way to 100%. But for the purposes of, of these RFPs and for the timelines that we're looking for, and, you know, 2027 or 2030 seems like a long ways away, but in, in project development time, you know, th those, those dates are really just around the corner. You bet. We should all live so long, too. Uh <laughs> The other, the other thing is, okay, it's a, it's a few years, um, you know, before we hit the target or we have the target. And it's also a few years before, um, you know, that 25-year period you talked about in the agreement, um, you know, will, will expire. The, the agreement, namely, will expire. And in that period, you can bet your bottom dollar that there will be new technologies, perhaps very disruptive technologies that that really take the whole thing to a new level uh, for the utility company and for the developer. Um, what kind of flexibility do you have and do they have to introduce new technology within that period? 
Sure. So there are a couple of ways that I think we can address and accommodate new technology. You know, one is that we're not changing our system, you know, 100% overnight. So not only do we have our own, you know, traditional units on the system that, that are still going to need to be, you know, retired and moved on from, we've got, you know, early generation renewable energy, right? We've got, you know, PV and other things from, you know, that are wind that are 10 plus years old. So those contracts are starting to come to sort of the end of their term, then we can either extend those or we can, you know, look for new technologies that that replace that. So at the end of this next 20 or 25 years for these, you know, these three stages of, of RFP projects that come along, you know, we're hoping and we're expecting that there'll be, you know, improvements that we're not, you know, to, to technology or improvements to things. So if there's major disruptors, you know, that will be, you know, well situated to to adopt those things. Yeah, very well, we're all happy to see that happen because in, at the end, it's um, it, it, it probably means um, you know um, more efficiency, um, more reliability, and maybe a better price. And that and that's where I want to uh, talk to you about now: the better price. So if if I have to build um, an energy development facility, it costs money, and and that money has to be folded in somehow um, to the price I get in the negotiation of the proposal. Um, and it has to be, you know, folded in also to the rates uh, that are charged. Um, so every time I spend, say, a million dollars on a given project, somebody's got to pay for that, not necessarily immediately, but over, over time. Um, and so that raises the question of whether shifting to renewables under an RFP process like this is going to result in higher rates for consumers, rate payers, or not? So price is very important. And so the price, I mean, the cost of development gets folded into the, the contract pricing. And so what we'll pay, you know, on an annual or on a monthly basis to, to the project. And so that pricing gets analyzed. That's part of what the application to the PUC is, is, is going to cover. And so that approval will be the approval for, for Hawaiian Electric to, to pay those that agreed upon contract price and then, you know, get recovery for, for those payments. So we're making the case that as best as we can project those, you know, those are reasonable um, rates to, to pass along to customers. Will I pay more or less? It's, I mean, it's really hard to say. It's, it depends on, you know, the benchmark now is the cost of, of fossil fuel, cost of oil. And so in 2022, 23 rates, in, you know, those cost of oil is very high, um, but, you know, it's much harder to predict down down the road. So we, we make projections, you know, we've got forecasts. And so, you know, the projects that we pick, you know, we, we want them to show benefits to customers. So that's that's the way that we, we analyze and that's the way that we'll present it for approval. What about expansion of the system in general, you know, expansion of the capacity of the system? There's been so many articles recently in the paper about how people are voting with their feet. That is, they're leaving town and there's not as many kids in school and the population is actually declining. And so, of course, uh, you know, if you're making this kind of analysis about how much to acquire and how to deploy it and all that, you have to consider, you know, the future population of the state. Um, what does that look like, at least from your point of view, and how does it affect your planning? Sure. I mean, we're getting into the more planning-centric um, topic, but I think the other things that we, we look at definitely, and it's really more than just population-based, because you know, as we've seen energy efficiency, even even things like that, that they've reduced, you know, demand, reduced load for things. But as we start to electrify more segments of the economy and transportation and, and EVs, you know, that's a big one. Um, but as a more, depending on how quickly and how much electrification gets adopted, you know, that'll really drive you know needs. Yeah. Okay. Well. Wow. This is this is actually a happy time to see you move so quickly like this. Uh, three stages already in the last few years. That's impressive, um, and and I I can only uh, think that uh, that it's good for all of us. It's good for the community, and after all, Hawaiian Electric is our utility company. We are wedded to you. We are bound to you. We are married to you now for a hundred years, and it will stay that way. <laughs> Any comments on that? Sure. We've got we've got lots and lots and lots of you know hardworking Hawaii people here working on on these these very issues and to 
to you know to do right by it, you know, by our state and our our islands. And so we're we're working hard and working quickly to to bring these you know renewable energy projects on you know as quickly and as successfully as we can. Yeah, but it is a completely moving target. That thing. Yeah, I mean, and to say nothing about all the governmental changes and and um, you know the officials involved and so forth, they change too. It all, it all, it's a, it's a completely moving target. So, how would you? What would you want consumers to think, ratepayers to think about this stage of the uh, renewable acquisition program? Uh, how would you like them? What would you like them to take away from this discussion? Yeah, this this effort really is the continuation of our our, our march to to create our, you know energy security. Um, Greater, um, less reliance on, on fossil fuels, um, better for the environment, and then more, you know, more stable rates for for customers. And so this is, um, we're, you know, we're, we're making progress to to a, a clean energy future, decarbonized future for that. You know, that's in line with not only Hawaiian Electric's goals, but our our state's goals as a whole. It strikes me that um, you know we also want them. I say we. I mean everyone wants them not to complain about things that are not really worthy complaints. You know, so many times we've seen, and I'm saying this from my own experience, uh, so many times we've seen situations where um, uh, neighborhoods have said, okay, you can build that renewable project. And then a couple of years later, they change their minds. And then everybody's in the soup over it. Um, and, and I would say to them, I don't see if you agree, I would say to them, hey, come on, but this is a collaborative effort. Uh, we're all in this, and we all want to work together, and we don't want to move backward. We want to move forward. So how about some collaboration, some cooperation uh, with these plans and arrangements and programs that Hawaiian Electric comes up with? Let's do it together. What would you say to that? We, we're definitely all in this together, I think, you know, from beginning to end. And I think that's, that's really why there's a lot of focus and lots of iteration on our community outreach efforts. And so, you know, the places that are, you know, these things are are not no impact. You know, we definitely recognize that. But being open and upfront and communicative about, you know, with our our, our neighbors and our communities about, you know, what these projects are going to look like, what it's going to take to to reach our goals, um, and just be very upfront and and proactive about letting people know what's happening, you know, what the plans are, and again, giving them an opportunity, giving you know. Our relatives, our neighbors, the opportunity to to get let their voices be heard and to to give feedback and in, in, in a meaningful way. And so that's why we you know we're we're doing our part. We're doing our best to to be proactive with that. We we encourage require our, our developers to to understand that when they come into a, a community and when they want to participate in our RFPs, these are things that are very important to us. Yeah, we're all in this together, and we have got to move forward, and we've got to protect ourselves and be resilient in the case of climate change and all those things. Well, thank you, Greg. I mean, part of that, part of this is that uh, you talk to us. That's a nice part of it. And the, and the, uh, the, and the downline is you will talk to us again, because we'll be back to you and we'll want to check the status and the progress of this project and other acquisition projects in which you're involved. Thank you so much for coming on Think Tech, Greg. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.